Um, so good morning, everybody. Uh, excited to have um, James Willig come and present to us again today. So I think most folks are familiar with James. Um, you know, I met James over 10 years ago. We came together to work um, and starting at the 1917 clinic with the 1917 clinic cohort, which is a, was a SQL database. At the time, had about 1,200 patients. Um, James knew a lot about data as well as clinical medicine and, and research, but knew a lot about data, data management, and um, informatics. And at first, I was just really impressed with how he thought about data um, in this small clinic. And then really over the last 10 years, I've been blown away and incredibly inspired by him and his partner, Alfredo Guzman, who can't be here because he's um, actually pursuing his education, has a commitment elsewhere. But in how they think about data, and not just data in databases and data capture, but novel ways, novel data elements, and novel platforms to capture data. And one of those mechanisms has been, beyond data management, software development. And a big part of that has been patient-reported outcomes. And again, it's been amazing in 10 years to see the vision that James and Alfredo have had in taking these transformative technologies and deploying them not only in this one clinic with one chronic disease and 3,000 patients, but developing collaborations across campus, across the country, and really around the world, and thinking about how do we deploy PROs through different technologies, mobile devices, um, within clinic workflow to really capitalize on the capture of these distinct data elements um, to help us provide better care to individuals and populations. So, James is always engaging and fun and really appreciate him. He's talked to us before about the many lives of data, and this is really more about the do's and don'ts of PRO implementation. And I'll say one thing just briefly that I think by being a clinician in the clinical environment and not purely a clinical informatician, you know, James brings the understanding of having to fit these tools into clinic workflow or into patients' lives, that the best tools, if deployed in a way that are going to shut down a clinic or interfere with someone's life, are not going to get used. So bringing that perspective in, how do you implement these um, technologies within the context of a particular um, setting or workflow um, is really a, a unique uh, gift and talent that he's brought to this work. So James, thanks for joining us. See a lot of good friends out there. <laughs> it's good to see you all this morning. Thanks for, uh, I'm sure you all had better things to do. <laughs> um, so let me tell you a little bit about implementing patient reported outcomes and um, these are just kind of a, a standardized surveys or validated surveys that people can fill out to get a score and they're done across multiple domains and people spend their lives building a validated questionnaire to measure I don't know if the Lakers should win um, or some such thing but let's first start giving you a background um, <coughs> So I think this is kind of our roadmap for today. We'll look a little bit about why implement PROs and review the concept of the innovation space and talk about some of the our early implementations and, and how those fell short, some of our later implementations, the lessons that we learned from those, and the growth of patient-reported outcomes at this time. So this all story kind of starts in the 1917 clinic. So this is going back a little bit. starts in, in the mid to late 80s um, down the street. Currently over 3,300 clients. Initially in the 80s, we're looking at a clinic that had less than 50 people attending it, and it was mostly people diagnosed with HIV in large cities um, who had kind of left Birmingham to go live their lives in other parts of the country. And when they were diagnosed, a lot of them came to say goodbye, to say goodbye to their families, to their friends, to kind of be live the end of their lives where they were from, because really HIV was a lethal diagnosis in the 80s. We really didn't know anything that worked and wouldn't know anything that really worked until about 94, 95. Um, so these people start coming back. Now, Dr. Sag has written a beautiful story of the 1917 clinic. The first half of this book tells you sort of a lot of the, the, the founding stories. It's kind of watching one of those superhero movies where they tell you the origin, and it, it kind of goes that way. Um, and, and it is a very nice story, but this is my story of the 1917 clinic, and it's just these are the data types that were added in each of these significant years. And the growth of the data, the data capture really traces the expansion of the clinic's research agenda and its footprint. And the concept here, I like to see it as the innovation space. And the innovation space really says that on one axis, you have all the data types that you capture. And on another axis, you have the types of analyses that you can do. 
And the product of those two in your environment is kind of the size of the cube where you can in you innovate. So to really innovate and bring something new to the table, you're going to have to bring new analytic techniques to the forefront on the data that you already have, or you're going to need to capture new data types that your other competitors do not have that you can sort of do analysis on using standard analytic techniques. But among one of those two axes, you innovate. I always like to use this example. Bless you. If someone was asking me about 30-day readmissions for patients with heart failure in the hospital, I would think that the data types that they'd want to use would include demographic, lab, medication, diagnostic, admission, and comorbidity data. And let's say that this is the types of analyses that we have available. So I would say, you know what? What you're really talking about is using these independent variables, use logistic regression from your analytic axis, and then use admission data sort of to be your outcome. And that's it. I would say, yes, we can do that study here, and these are the independent variables and the dependent variables that we can get from. So the first thing that you need to do wherever you go is you need to understand the innovation space of where it is that you're exerting your research. And again, your job is going to be create new knowledge. Your job is going to be innovate. And I think the innovation space gives you a framework to see how can I bring new things? What types of analysis are these people, you know, out there in engineering doing and public health doing that I can bring over to my field and that maybe isn't as known in my box? And what types of data can I capture? So with the spirit of this, I would say that all these data types are more like Lego blocks that you can recombine with your own creativity for your own research. So now why is that? What this explains to you why the 1917 clinic wanted to get patient reported outcomes. We wanted to innovate. We wanted to get a new data type, and we wanted to have a new data type that we captured that almost no one else was capturing at that time so that we could insert it as independent variables and dependent variables in our analyses. So that's what we talked about. Our purpose, the first time we tried this in 2004, was exclusively research. That's what we wanted to do. We wanted to give the researchers a whole new data set so that they could do novel things that our other competitor HIV clinics really couldn't do. We wanted to, in a sense, expand our innovation space. So <clears throat> what did we do? For about nine months, we got ourselves a bunch of clever programmers, and we started something called the Patient Information Questionnaire. And we went to just about every researcher in the clinic and said, listen, if we could put a standardized survey in front of a patient, just on any domain, what would you want it to be? And we really went around the room, went to everybody, ended up with about 20 to 25 instruments. Um, the instruments. All, some of them were 36-question instruments. Some of them were 40-question instruments. <laughs> the burden to someone doing the pick was well over 250 questions. Again, we were just thinking research. We weren't really taking anything else into account, and we built this beautiful piece of software that would do this. It took us nine months to program. We were immensely proud of it. We went ahead, and we put it in one kiosk by the door of the clinic. By the waiting room, one kiosk, and we began it on this one day. And we were sitting, the clinic starts at 1, we were sitting there at 3.30. I remember I was sitting beside our clinic director at that time. I don't know if you guys have met Jim Raper, but he looks like he started lifting weights when he was around 3 years old. <laughs> I can imagine, I see little taller Jim Raper just pumping out. <laughs> and little taller Jim, Jim Raper was significantly larger than taller at this point. He was more like a wall. And he says, where are the patients? It's 3.30, nobody's in here. And it turned out there was one person that had this difficulty with reading, which we didn't know until that day when we hadn't tried to answer a 250-question survey. And they were sitting there looking at these things. First time they'd ever messed around with a keyboard and mouse. So it was like <coughs> moving the mouse. It was a very different interface to them. They never really had the opportunity to learn from that. And they were in about question 115 out of 250. Jim Raper just lost it. He went up there, he unplugged the thing, he threw it on the ground, he stomped it, and he said, we're not doing this anymore. <laughs> Let the patients in. So PRO became a four-letter word at the 1917 clinic for many years. Um, so again, some of the things that we did wrong, let's review. Long instruments. We had no, we did not care about the clients. We did not say, gosh, what is a reasonable amount of questions for someone to do? We said, whoa, from the research perspective, we want all this data. It's going to be awesome. So here's 250 questions for every person that walks into the door. Single point of administration completely created a logjam in clinic workflow. Solely 
researcher-driven instruments. We did not even include the clinicians. We didn't, we didn't talk to them. Why would they care about this? This was research. Well, it's kind of research in their clinical setting, in their daily lives. The people that were paying the price, who were being slowed down, was every nurse, pharmacist, uh, uh, social worker, clinician that was there, and more importantly, the patients, the clients that we were serving. All of these people were paying the price of our research and we had not even thought to include them in the discussion. And also, we really did not know our audience. We didn't know that a lot of our clients hadn't had access to, to, to a keyboard and mouse interface, that, they, that computers weren't part of their daily lives, and they had really not a lot of experience with that interface. This is 2004. Um, we had no idea about what the, the font size on the screen Sometimes we put 10 or 12 questions on that screen in the smallest font you can imagine. We had people who used glasses, forgot their glasses, were barely literate, and here we're putting this tiny text that was even hard for us to read. But in our enthusiasm, we never stopped to think about any of that. So these are some of the factors that led to what was a beautiful failure. Now, for many years, you could not say PRO at 1970 Clinic. And in 2007, Dr. Sag says, I want you to go talk to Jim Raper about restarting the PRO. <laughs> and I say, I thought you liked me. I thought we got along, but now you're sending me to talk to Jim Raper. I remember 2004. He's going to, you know, stop me now. Um, but he said, no, 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 no. You, you can talk him into it. Just, just think about it. Think about how to do it better. So as you can imagine, with the fear of having to walk into Jim Raper's office and have this conversation, I thought about this question long and long. And some of the things we came up with around the time were, listen, it can't just be the researchers choosing domains. We got to give the clinicians something to do, right? The, the clinicians, how am I going to make this attractive to a clinician? Well, if I capture data that makes that the clinician would have captured on their own, but now I'm capturing it for them, maybe I might save them a little time. And also, I might take away from them the burden of asking all these questions. Clinicians, you know, they want to go from A to B, but you see, they have one of these. So your life becomes, I'm going to go to this, wait, I'm getting paid over here, wait, I'm getting paid over here, wait, I'm getting paid over here, where am I, what am I doing, who am I, what day is it, that sort of, and eventually you stumble into someone and you're like, oh yeah, I was supposed to do this thing. So the clinician is unpredictable, their lives are unpredictable, but the data that they have to capture in many ways is predictable. If I'm an HIV doctor, I want to know. If my client has been adherent to their medicines because the success of the therapy relies on their medication adherence, I want to know other things that influence medication adherence. Are they depressed? Is there substance abuse? Are they still smoking? How about alcohol? Um, these are some domains that are just relevant to my practice. And if I had time and I had the ability to ask them to every client, boy, I'd like to know that. Well, why don't we ask that for every client? Let's go ahead and do it. That's valuable information for the clinician. You know what? That's valuable information for the researchers, too. But there are some research domains that the clinicians aren't going to want to hear about. The clinicians might not be making a decision at the point of care on something like stigma in HIV. That's not going to help me write a prescription. However, if I'm able to collect such data, that gives me preliminary data that I can use in the grant, preliminary data that I can use to bring in resources to the clinic, and grow my research arm. So there is a point at which both sides benefit. So if you just ask the researchers, they're going to say, these are the domains that are important to us. And if you just ask the clinicians, these are domains that are important to them. But we decided to be kind of a bridge. And we sort of talked about this, what's the ratio? And we don't, I can't tell you what the golden ratio is. I use the expression, the golden ratio, because I think in, I think it was, I can't remember if it was some Greek painting, but El Greco used this. And it was about the size of your figure is five times the size of the head. So you, the body of your kind is sort of four <clears throat> units and the, the head is one. Um, so from an obscure Spanish painter, I figured out that the ratio should be four to one. I don't know, I just came. <laughs> so that's what we said. We said we're going to give you three or four clinical ones for one research one. Carefully select the instruments. I came to learn as I read more about patient reported outcomes that there was, yes, there was an SF36, but there was also an SF12. 
<laughs> yes, there was a 48 questionnaire for this thing, but there was also a 10 questionnaire, 10 question questionnaire for this that actually was similarly validated. And then, so brevity is your friend. And then I learned about computer adaptive testing. Um, around this time, the Promise Initiative had been going on for a year. That was the Patient Player Oculus Measurement Information Systems. All of these things are sort of in the NIH toolbox now, and you can access them through, um, through an API that's kept at Northwestern. And it gives you a ton of domains that you can access, and it gives you questions. Where if it, if, a question of, do you all know what computer adaptive testing is? May I give you an example? Who doesn't know what it is? Do you want, okay. All right, so here it is. I'm going to give you a, ten, a, a nine question. I'm going to use the PHQ-9 to screen for depression. So I'm going to ask you nine questions every time, and I'm going to sum up all of that to equal your depression score. Now let's look at a computer adaptive version of that. I'm going to ask everybody the same first question. Hey, how you doing today? Eh. Question number two. You thought about killing yourself? Yes, every day. You know what? I'm not going to ask you the other seven questions. I think you're depressed already. I got it. That's a severe answer. Mathematically, I can already sort of calculate that you're going, you're going to end up in this range. So you can ask. That's a very simplistic explanation. There's a lot of mathematics called psychometrics in there, which I don't understand. And the people who do psycho, the psychometricians, I call them psychomagicians. Um, <laughs> but these are very intelligent people that do a lot of mathematics that's way beyond me. But the idea is that we start everybody with a similar set of questions. And then the next couple of questions, we can almost predict what their, the band of their results is going to be with a lot of fidelity. So computer adaptive testing, of course, if I'm going to ask somebody nine depression questions every time, and now I can get away with asking them three or four, I've net saved time um, for that questionnaire. And I'm getting results of the same quality. So very wonderful stuff. And then you need to, we needed to understand the clinic workflow a little bit better was the other thing that I thought. I said, well, we had one station. We had this log jam at the entryway of the clinic. So we started walking around the clinic, sort of, this is what a patient would do. They'd first walk to the front desk and check in. Then they have a little bit of wait time here before the nurses call them into triage. Hey, come over here. I'm going to get your vital signs. Answer some questions. So now they walk to another part of the clinic. They have their vital signs taken. Then they were put in the room. And then they waited in that room until they were seen by a provider. Because for a teaching clinic, there was a first provider, which is a nurse practitioner or a fellow, and then there was a second provider. So when they were seen by that first provider, and that first provider went to report to that attending physician, there was a second pocket of wait time. Then they were sent for the lab, at which time they waited some more. Then they went to check out, and then they went to the pharmacy, which was another pocket of wait time. So by understanding walking the clinic as a patient would, you begin to understand what are the places where the clients wait. <coughs> this told us that when we designed the software, we wanted to be interruptible was the word that we use, which is if you started in one pocket of wait time and a nurse called you back to triage, you had to stop because that was clinic workflow. That had to keep going. So the software had to be able to say, okay, um, stop here and restart it in the next computer, and you can restart one question back from where you were before. So by analyzing that clinic workflow and making our design fit that reality, we were able to accommodate one single instance across multiple time points during one clinic visit. And that was a key, that was a key thing for us because, and it really was the foundation of understanding that you can have the nicest software we had. And let me tell you, what we have now is probably you know, 80% as nice as what we had in 2004. What we had in 2004 completely failed, not for any reason related to the quality of the software, but for all the reasons related to the implementation, and we didn't just think it through our environment. But we had better software in 2004, but the software in 2007 worked a heck of a lot better than the 2004 software did and serves us to this day. Um, but these were the pockets of wait time. We also decided to change the interface. Through some colleagues from the University of Washington in Seattle, they were really big on using tablets and touchscreens. Around the same time, we had, create, we had created our own electronic health record, and we had put it on tablets. And it was great. But tablets were around $3,000 in 2004. And in the first week, two tablets were dropped. We were not enthusiastic about giving $3,000 tablets in 2007 to uh, a bunch of folks um, with, you know, all kinds of... Uh, neurologic diseases and weakness and things that could lead to things getting dropped. 
So we decided to put touchscreens that were either stationary or mounted on the wall. But the touchscreen, which the people from Seattle, our colleagues from Seattle, Heidi Crane, convinced us was a good idea, really was interesting because we had a bunch of people who had never interacted with a keyboard and mouse. All of a sudden, they were just like, click, 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 <laughs> next, and they were able to sail right through it. And then the clients were really proud. Some clients were like, yeah, I work with a computer today. We got a couple of people calling up. You'd never know what I was doing. Uh, this was flip phone, so this was a <laughs> That's a smart one. So they're like, yeah, I'll just use the computer. And people get a little, little proud. And the other thing that started showing up, I think I saw my colleague walk in here. Um, so they started noticing who couldn't read by people who fought, forgot their glasses every time they came to clinic, and they had to have someone read the questions for them. So little insights like maybe maybe he can't keep track of the eight prescriptions we have him on because he can't read the instructions and we've never really stopped to figure that out before. This started giving us some secondary benefits of that. So you can see the workflow changed, the construction of the surveys changed, our attitude changed, and our technology changed to do it. Here's sort of where you can continue if you're interrupted in the waiting room. We put this where the physicians sit and you can see sort of a progress bar for where people are in their questionnaire. At any time, I can click and see a summary screening report like this. It'll give me sort of the last three times they filled it, and I can start seeing things. You know, this person, for example, is using condoms all the time. That makes us very happy in terms of the epidemiology and the spread of HIV. Um, you can see that their alcohol risk score looks like back here, you know, there are some conversations, things have gotten better, this person is not depressed. Um, and right away, this gives me a great summary that I can see what's going on. I can congratulate this person this time because they were smoking when I saw them here, but now they're not. They previously smoked. So all the talking and all the, the, the intervention that was done in these two visits led to this person not smoking currently. So that now all of a sudden, I have a great data set. I haven't asked a question. There's a clinician. I opened this up, and the time it would have taken me to ask all of this is probably around seven to eight minutes. Now I have a summary that I can work on right away. What was cool about this for me was that all of a sudden I walked in there and I started finding things out that I didn't know about people before. So there's something called the social desirability bias, which is when I ask someone a question, they were going to give me the answer that is, is sort of, it's going to make them, cast them in the best light compared to me. And I also learned about the relationships with, with my clients. I said, if I have a good relationship with a client and I ask a very sensitive domain, if I say, have you been using... IV heroin since I last saw you, and they see the concern in my voice. They're going to say, man, I don't want to worry, Doc. We, he's a good guy. We've been working for years. And, nah, Doc, I'm over that. It's all good. That's a good relationship. What if I have a more judgmental relationship when I'm like, so you still you still uh, ejecting heroin like you always are? <laughs> he's going to say, you're going to think like, wow, what a jerk. He's going to say, no, I'm not. <laughs> so good relationship, bad relationship, sensitive domain, truth is going to be biased. Your answer is going to be biased. The computer screen, we looked at the human computer interface literature, there's a lot less uh, transference or counter transference from the computer screen and people just answer what they have in front of them more readily. It's not perfect. You'll still find discrepancies. However, you're more likely to get closer to the truth overall through this across sensitive domains. So all of a sudden, here we have this great data set. So why we did it in 2008, 2007, our motivation was different. We now wanted to enhance care. We wanted to tell our clinicians, we have a way to make your day a little lighter. And we have a day to give you a data set that will allow you to make decisions and improve your patient care. You can do your job better if you do this. We also layered things on it. We layered alerts. If you were suicidal, a social worker, um, sorry, a psychologist would get paged and they would come and do a full assessment for safety. You should have seen the faces of some of our clinicians when they walked through a room and there was a psychologist saying, you know, your patient has a plan and the means and I believe we should send him to the ER right now because he's suicidal. And I remember a particular provider that pushed through and said, that's hogwash. I've known this person for 10 years. They go, in, this crazy computer is saying that you're suicidal and you've never told me that. What is that? And the patient broke out crying and said, I am suicidal. He said, I've never told you because I don't want to worry you. And that provider just sat down. And that provider became our biggest advocate 
for, hey, this is important. We got to get people to do this. Um, because again, that good relationship doesn't, sometimes the patient won't tell you because they like you. They don't want to worry you. Um, so now we're screening for suicidal ideation. We're screening for intimate partner violence. We're even screening for studies where we can page someone, rather than have them stand in the clinic, we can page and say, hey, here's, a, here's someone who fits your enrollment criteria based on PROs. So there's a lot of things that you can do with the data. It isn't just captured and sitting there. It's sort of captured. The reuse of the data has to be multiple. It's helping the clinician. It's helping the patient receive better care. It's helping us put safety systems in the clinic to monitor for things we didn't monitor before. And in terms of research, my goodness, this, by adding this to our innovation space, we suddenly had a data set that we were capturing routinely that pretty much only one HIV clinic at the time really had. We eclipsed what they had done in seven years. We eclipsed it in two years just because we thought the work a little bit better. Then they came and they, they sort of took our workflow and implemented in their clinic, and now I think we're neck to neck. Um, but this changed things. Some of the early stuff we did, right? Here's something about people reporting um, sort of suicidal ideation, um, the relationships between sort of self-reported depression and self-reported suicidal ideation. And the thing that I found interesting in this is, of course, no depression is protective for reporting suicidal ideation. But then, of course, as you see the severity of the depression increase, as you would expect, the likelihood of the suicidal ideation being reported increases. And then this was an interesting tidbit that led to another study where we found that substance abuse, when you ask people directly with a patient-reported outcome, you get an answer that's not binary. It's not, do you use IV heroin, yes or no? You get an answer where you can get current, prior, or and never. And that, that really sort of stuck with us. That said, wow, we're able to discern who's actively using. And we found that when we modeled this, Historical, yes, I used to use IV heroin, but that's not associated with current suicidal ideation. But current use certainly was. And that made all the sense in the world because there's people that overcome the addiction and their life is in a different place and they're no longer suicidal. But it made us look at our discrete data and electronic health record and sort of start wondering, how about our problem list? Are our problem list as good as what people are saying? And of course, we found a lot of differences there. You can see that in the chart, in terms of current substance abuse, here you can see um, about 99 people were current substance abusers. But the reality when they self-reported was about half of that. And what was going on? What was going on was that every single one of us records substance abuse differently. I realized that if someone told me, I stopped, using, I stopped using IV heroin, I couldn't be happier. I took it off their problems. That was fantastic. And then Dr. Raper again would always tell me, he would say, he stopped using IV heroin. Boy, that's wonderful. And he'd say, people change. And he'd walk away. And then he'd look over his shoulder and say, but not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, in the next visit, the PRO showed that guy using IV heroin again. So Raper will not take a diagnosis of a serious <coughs> substance abuse off his chart for about two years. If you're clean for about two years, then you'll take it off. But what does that do to all of you when you ask us for a data set? We're just going to get the discrete data and you're going to say, is this person using IV heroin? Yes. So we hand you a data set and you have double the number of current IV heroin users than is real. Our new analyses get contaminated by the fact that we all have different biases as providers when we record this data, and who knows what you're reporting. But if you use the patient-reported outcomes, then you're probably a lot closer to the truth. So we started finding out a lot of interesting things, and we actually started using these same variables, or we started using these patient-reported outcomes variables in a lot of the same studies we'd done years before, but substituting patient-reported outcomes for substance abuse to see what was the difference. Here's one thing that we did. So we just, this is a very simple thing. It's a logistic regression of um, what is associated with self-reported poor adherence to antiretroviral therapy. Mm -hmm. And the literature would tell you things like substance abuse is associated and, and, and you know, race is associated, a lot of things. Depression is associated. When we looked at our chart diagnoses, it didn't really match up with everything that the literature was reporting. When we substituted PRO variables, for those 
we did find the associations that the literature was reporting more likely. Um, so we kind of started thinking, well, you know, sorry about those 10 years of publications with just diagnostic data. <laughs> we, uh, sorry for the effect we had on the guidelines. Sorry for all the static that we put into reality. Uh, we'll do better now with this new data source. But it's exciting when you have a new data source, and I encourage you, you should always be looking at that x-axis, and you should always be trying. Well, here's a new way to capture information on your answer should be great. Let's do it. Let's compare it to what we have. Because we found that we weren't, um, that we had room to get better. So what some of the lessons that we learned, right? Um, just to go over some of these, you know, you have to balance the research and the clinical imperatives. In 2004, we couldn't see through research data capture, and it led to us going off the cliff. Um, I like to think of this tragedy of the commons concept from game theory, where it's sort of the classic overfishing scenario that we all agree to take one fish, but then I'm fishing and I'm like, yeah, you know what, I need 10 fish, I need a little extra revenue this week, so I'm sure that the rest of you won't mind. But then half of us start, eh, let me get 10 extra fish, and then we overfish the thing and then there's nothing. So I started thinking of the time that the client has to fill these PROs, their tolerance for it, will they do it repeatedly, um, that that was the overfishing scenario. And that someone had to be the steward and not let everybody say, because everybody's going to say, I got one more domain. That if we add this, it's going to be awesome. And that domain is part of their research. And of course, they think it's awesome. It's the most important thing to them. And they're passionate about it. And these are well-prepared, intelligent, fabulous people. And they just want to add one more domain. But if you just keep lengthening your questionnaire, eventually you're overfishing. And people start signing off and saying, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm sick of this. You ask me this every time. And so you really, someone has to monitor that. And that's a tough conversation because the clinical stuff is useful now. It'll be useful in 10 years. But if you have that ratio and you have what well, we started thinking of them as research slots, and you can convince people, okay, we're going to use these research slots for these domains for this amount of time, and then they're going to free up again for the next research. You have to create a, a, a kind of a, a resource that's renewable and gains multiple people. Now, I've, I'm going to say that I'm not fully convinced our researchers to do it this way. Most of the time I hear, no, no, but my domain is the most important one ever. And, you know, I, it's been tough to do. But I, but I think we, we've gotten to the point where we're overfishing um, and we have an issue. I don't know. What, what would you say to that, uh, Sarah? Yeah, I have to agree with you. Um, definitely a lot. You know, when you add a new domain, it has 30 seconds to a minute to patient's wait time, and then it pushes back everyone um, who's waiting to get in that room. And, yeah. And a lot of investigators don't realize that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. So if you implement something, oh, Dr. Curtis. So maybe you don't always need the same kind of fish, though, every time you go fishing. So have you implemented the adaptability that, you know, this domain, people say, you know what, if we had this once a year, that would be great. Yes. And so you don't need everything in every visit. So has yeah. that concept surfaced? Yes. Yes. So the frequency of the domains is another thing we try to argue the researchers for because, again, that's an easy way to double our domains if they're every, yeah. if they alternate. Um, but, boy, it's tough. It, the, most researchers, the, 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 the answer to the question, would you like more data or less data? <laughs> I'm going to go with number one. Number one sounds better to me. And maybe just operationally, something else that comes up is in terms of IRB and how do you handle this. And we've done it different ways, even within the clinic. Um, so in some scenarios, we have a PRO battery that is purely clinical. So for any patient orientation, all the domains are clinically relevant. The social workers, you know, um, selected them. So in that scenario, we don't get informed consent to complete the PROs. We have a, a waiver of written informed consent. These, these are data captured for clinical care, but the IRB allows us with approval to use those data for research purposes as aggregate um, de identified data. Um, and, you know, we haven't done that with the routine PROs in the clinic, but something we have done is here's a standard battery of PROs, and when the ambitious investigator wants to add something, if there isn't that open slot to fit into, I've taken one of two approaches. One is to add an info sheet, if it's pretty short, and say, you have completed the standard battery you agreed to complete. By clicking the next button, you will voluntarily complete this additional domain. And those are time-limited. 
you know, a few hundred participants, one at a time. And the other scenario, if the instruments are, are longer, is to say, we're going to separate it from the, the battery that James showed, the nice workflow, and say, after your visit, we can get separate informed consent to complete this separate questionnaire, typically with remuneration, you know, and, and do it that way. So just even when you embed a routine platform, there's ways, I think, IRB-wise, and also when you when you do them, want to say, well, how do we have all these folks coming on to add to it? I think mm -hmm. we've, and Sarah's been instrumental in this work within our clinic to figure out how do we do this so, so that we don't make Jim Raper angry. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Hulk, making the Hulk angry. You don't want to do that. <laughs> That's, that's our goal for it. <laughs> 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 he starts, veins start popping out in his head. <laughs> so, um, see, you gotta understand that if you're running a platform like this, you're kind of you're kind of the ref. Players don't like you, fans don't like you, <laughs> but somebody gotta be the ref. You gotta be. Listen, we no, I'm not gonna give you that domain now. Come back in six months, and they're like, oh, you, you, <laughs> you. But somebody got to be the ref. If you're not the ref, you get you get these things. You get what we had in 2004, and that didn't work, and that didn't help anybody. Um, brevity matters. Um, <laughs> you have to really think of the – you have to weigh the overall time cost of a panel, not individual instruments. So when people say, this instrument, it's only 90 seconds. 90 seconds. Of course you want it. It's not, you didn't even go feel it. It's 90 seconds across a population of 3,300 people, of which like 100 are seen every day, which summed up by those 100 people, 300 seconds is now this many minutes, and that pushes workflow, and then we have to pay overtime for this person, that person, that person, that person. Jim Raper comes out of his office. <laughs> Never good. <laughs> Never good. So you have to really view it as what is the time cost of the panel. Um, compact instruments, if, you know, if the literature is there to show you that a compact instrument is equally valid for your research purposes, I'm going to default to that compact, compact instrument. Um, and um, the computer adaptive testing, it is your friend. Um, I think Dr. Curtis, I have to ask him to explain to me how the promise is interpreted every two or three months because he really has a grasp on it. But every time he explains in about two months, I, uh, I, I can't understand it anymore, um, but it is really powerful to be able to use a questionnaire that's just a few questions as opposed to these gigantic domains uh, or questionnaires of the past. Would you like to say something about PROMIS and your experience with it? Yeah, so PROMIS is the NIH's system to, in my opinion, fill in the gaps of what the SF36 and things like it failed to do. So I've yet to meet a clinician who actually uses the SF36 in clinical practice. Nobody wants it. It's 36 questions. It's just way too long. Uh, you know, Dr. Raper would come out angry and halfway through, <laughs> or even less. So I, I've never met a clinician that uses it because it's just too long, and it's always the same questions. And I've had patients say, why are you asking me the same thing? You know I can't, you know, walk two miles on flat ground. I mean, things that, you know, somebody with bad rheumatoid arthritis and joint deformity, She'll never be able to do that, so quit asking her that. So the nice thing about it, though, it's normed against the U.S. population. The mean's 50. The standard deviation is 10. There's a minimally important difference, at least based on math, if not clinically important. But the beauty of it, it's validated. It has the imprimatur of the NIH attached to it. There are short forms. You can download it. You say, oh, this looks pretty straightforward. But to James's point, if all you have is paper, you can pick the shortest version, if you chose to, it's four questions. There's usually a four, a six, an eight question, then there's computer adaptive testing version. So there's lots and lots of choices. It's very, very easy to understand. It's in multiple languages. If you have a Spanish-speaking population, hooray, it's there. And if you have a Chinese-speaking population, so it's used across the world, and it allows you to compare people with COPD or arthritis or, or HIV or whatever your population is, because it's not disease specific. So it really has a lot of flexibility and can give you a lot of the things that legacy instruments took a long, long time uh, and are totally impractical for clinical care. There's also a resource called the Proceta Stone, not the Rosetta Stone, but the Proceta Stone. The idea is, is, you know, here we have hieroglyphs that can like translate to, to Greek. So if you're familiar with the PHQ at nine or eight, because you don't want to know about suicidality, you know, and that's like your baby and you just know that instrument up the yin yang, 
but you don't want to have to keep asking the same nine questions. You can map that to the promise instruments. It basically gives you a translatable version to take things, you know, the brief pain inventory or something that's more a legacy instrument and map it to the new domain. So you don't have to give up the tools that you're used to. You actually can translate that to some of the, the NIH promise tools and there is this conversion, which is super helpful. One of the exciting things about that too, how it was sold, um, was, hey, maybe you are a brief pain inventory person and you've been using it for eight years and now you want to do something different. Well, you don't have to throw away all your data and start from zero. Here's a way to convert it so that when your sample size, when you do a study, really includes everybody because you have a way to make those scores equivalent. Um, David, the other thing I, I like about Promise, and, and you've looked at some of the domains that I think are less, there's domains that I didn't expect to be there. Could you tell us about the domains that you're using in your study? Yeah, so um, we're looking at free admissions. I'm sure you guys have heard I've talked about it. Um, and, and it has uh, domains that I don't think are widely used in the SF36. Like, for example, it has uh, the domain of uh, relationships, and it has further subdomains of information support as well as social support. So, you know, uh, where do you get your information from? Do you feel like you have a reliable social group? that you can get reliable information from. Um, and they also have um, a very uh, diverse group of um, efficacy domains. So there's almost five in total of, say, general self-efficacy, efficacy to manage um, medications, efficacy to manage chronic illness. Um, so there's a few of those that are, I believe, very clinically relevant, in particular in the area of, say, chronic disease or acute care that uh, the yeah. promise is pretty robust for. So it's, it's, it's been intriguing because I think we calculate a readmission risk score based on the clinical data that have been captured in the electronic health system, basically all the labs, all the discrete diagnoses, and it calculates the severity score and, and also the visit data. This person has been to the ER this many times in this many months, and they say, boy, this person's about, he's a high likelihood of being readmitted. But I don't think that gives me any points to intervene. So I think it's, it's I like this idea of giving folks a lot of self-efficacy domains because if it turns out that I'm actually not efficacious in handling a complex medication regimen or that I have zero social support and that's why I keep ending up in the hospital, I feel that that gives us points of intervention that we can now say, well, I know what we need to do. We need to make it easier for you to accomplish this task and this goal. And it's a little, it feels like I can intervene there, whereas when I see high likelihood of readmission, I've got nothing to, to grasp returning that. So I'm, I'm curious to see how that'll turn out. Um, comprehensive stakeholder engagement is really important. Um, you know, one of the things that also I think we shot ourselves in the foot was when we designed this the first time in 2004, we exclusively talked to researchers. I mean, we just did. We didn't talk to clinicians. We didn't understand how it would affect workflow. But a conversation with your clinic staff, with everybody who's going to touch that patient and say, hey, listen, how can I do this and not impact your ability to triage? That conversation, basically from that conversation comes the ability that, oh, well, it just has to be interrupted. Because when I call somebody for triage, they got to come. That's the, that's, I open a slot in the waiting area and I put someone in the room and that starts the movement. So if I can't do that, the clinic doesn't move. Oh, wow, it's really important that when you say to someone, it's time to get your vitals, that they come immediately. Well, that produced the concept of interruptibility in the design of the software. Um, so you got to get your clinic staff, you got to talk to them, everybody has got to say, people have to understand, look, it's going to slow us all down a little bit, but look at the things we'll be able to do for our patients. The conversation got a lot easier when things like what I described with that provider in suicidality happened, when that provider saw value, when that provider said, this computer saw something that I couldn't see despite knowing this patient for 10 years, and it allowed me to provide better care today, and it's made my patient safer. He's got an intervention I didn't even know that patient needed. That changes. That, that provider was a champion for us. They argued for everybody. Um, so get your clinician buy-in, get your staff buy-in, and um, you're going to have to sell it to your patients too because patients are going to say, didn't I fill this out last time I was here? Why are you always asking me? Like seriously, do you want to know about who I had sex with? Like do I know you? Why are you asking me these questions? It's very uncomfortable for them. And you got to say, hey, listen, I know it's uncomfortable, but let me tell you. So when I come into a room and I look at this, I say, hey, I want to I make a point before the appointment is finished. I say, I want to thank you for answering all those questions. I was able to review all your answers and learn this. And that really helps me take better care of you. So I appreciate you taking the time. And I think that makes a world of difference. People are like, okay, 
So I don't think I hear very often, I don't want to fill out those questions. But from my colleagues, I hear, I, I hear more often that my patients are complaining about this. My patients, one or two of them have complained over the years, but in general, I make people know how grateful I am and how it makes me able to provide better care and it goes better. <laughs> Establish and assess metrics throughout. Um, you know, we started seeing things that we didn't even know we were going to see, like the literacy, the issues with literacy. There should be, you know, I think we haven't sort of standardized this, but people who work with Sarah, she can, they can see how rapidly the fill bar of the questions is going, and they can say, I bet you that person can't read. And they go in there and they do that. You can imagine if we if we had quantified that, if we had sort of thought something to time that, that would have been a reflection of literacy. We'd be able to track that a lot better. But we didn't think about that. Um, so assess the PRO continuation uh, completion rates of your clients. Um, assess clinician utilization of the data during encounters. We found that clinician uptake is very different. And of course, we get a new set of clinicians every year as we get new fellows, and we have to retrain them. And I can tell you that for some fellow classes, we've done a really good job training them. For other fellow classes, we have not. Um, and continuously assess your panel. Make sure that, you know, we're asking things in our panel about lipodystrophy, um, which is lipodystrophy and lipoatrophy are issues with the first generation of HIV drugs from the mid-90s. I don't know why we asked lipodystrophy, but the person who asked lipodystrophy is Dr. Very Important in HIV, and I can't tell them that we shouldn't talk about lipodystrophy in 2018. Tells me, boy, before you were born. I was, I was like, Come on, man. HIV wasn't, wasn't discovered before I was born, but okay. <laughs> but that's tough. You know, but you got to assess your panel. You can't, you can't just be beholden to the same panel forever. Um, so really put in some metrics. What is success? What is, Sarah can tell me, these many people have said no to the informed consent. These many people have said yes. We can track that over time. We can say, okay, we now have to intervene. We've got to talk to our population. Monitor yourself. Um, so growth. Um, the 1970 clinic today, after we've added this data type, I think has been probably one of the things that has really changed things for us in, in the last 10 years, I'd say. I think we have higher data quality. Um, we have data directly from the source. If you think about it, when the client tells me something, as a researcher, you're depending on whether I recorded it or not. So I had to filter it, record it with my bias. You're hoping that I didn't get moved out and forgot to record it for whatever data you're getting. Here, you've got data directly from the source. If it was a business deal and I asked you, would you like to buy from a distributor or would you like to buy directly from the person that produces the good at a cheaper price, more affordable, and more product for less money? you would say you would want that option. I don't think it's any different with data. Um, the clinical benefits are there. It really helps us. I mean, I am I had a patient commit suicide in 2001, and I had no idea. I never saw it coming. Um, a couple of clinic sessions later, one of, the, one of the nurses in clinic came with the obituary for this person, and I looked at that obituary, and all I could think of and replay in my mind was our last visit and the fact that I had no clue. I had no clue. And for years, um, I sort of, as <laughs> we all were want to do, sort of self-flagellated with that fact and figured out that I got to I gotta do better at this. Why didn't I know? And suicide became a little bit of an interest. You know, okay, why do people commit suicide? How many of them are in contact with the health system? And I've seen studies where it says that in the cohort of people who committed suicides, two-thirds were in contact with the health system the month before they committed suicide. Two-thirds. That means that we have that much opportunity. And to think that an electronic system is pointing out people that are suicidal and they're being sent to the ER when they're needed, to me, I'll, I'll never sort of live that down. Um, I know cognitively that there was no way I could have known, and I know all the logic for there, but still, I, I, I'm not going to get over that. But it helps when I know that other people we at least know of and do something now. So I feel like I did something, like I gave something back about that. Intimate part of violence is another thing that's very personal to me. It's something that um, one time we asked in the clinic and someone was being abused. And I remember I didn't know what to do. And I talked to my attending and he didn't know what to do. Um, but now we have a protocol put together by social workers, people that are qualified, who know what to do with this. And they have a protocol where we can have an abusive partner in the waiting room 
and we can take that abused client and put him in the shelter. You see, that's something that I, uh, that means a lot to me. And I think that there's clinical benefits more than what I can do as a clinician here to our system. The research benefits, the amount of people that have come into that clinic and asked for data sets and use this data in a clever way, in ways that I couldn't have even have envisioned, is tremendous. The amount of literature and, and high quality manuscripts that have come out of this is, is very gratifying. Um, we still have our challenges. Um, you know, cost is a challenge, implementation is a challenge, but we continue to hone those. We've grown. Other parts of the clinic started using this. Social services, other clinics, palliative care, breast health, um, pediatric neurosurgery. I couldn't get numbers on them lately, but they've been using it now for a couple of years. Um, we were even able to support an R01, uh, Dr. Mugavero's with his software asking a lot of these questions. But these numbers, you can see 44,000 signs and symptoms surveys. This is by, by around 2015. Our social service workers go ahead and they see a client and they do a part that's an interview. Then they hand them a tablet or sit them at a computer and they go and they see a next client. And then they give that person 20 minutes, they see the fill bar, so they're able to see, we made our social workers more efficient. Where they would have to see a client and spend an hour with them. Now they spent about 40 minutes with the client, split between what part of their interview has to be person to person. Then the patient fills out a bunch of data on the PRO, then they come back, get a summary sheet, and that patient starts getting connected to services right away. Oh wow, you're depressed, I'm referring you to psychiatry. Um, oh wow, you, um, you don't have a home, you're currently homeless, I, I need to connect you over here. Ah, there's some issues with you with food security. Uh, there's, there's issues with you, um, you were just incarcerated. What's your support system now? What do you have? And they can connect to that. And at the same time, the social worker is not sitting there asking all those questions, they're actually seeing another client. And they're coming back and finishing up that visit. So their visit, their practice changed, and I think our social workers start talking about evidence-based social work. And that's a real interesting concept to me because if there's something that's hard for me to understand and highly touchy-feely, it's social work. <laughs> and, but here, I can talk to the social workers about what are the evidence-based interventions that have the most impact in your practice. And now I can have that conversation with them, whereas before I, I couldn't. Um, we've made sort of this web-based platform to capture patient reported outcomes. We've used it in, in different settings. We did this grant several years ago, PLCI collaboration, Dr. Curtis and Dr. Muavero and, and several other folks. We basically have an instrument library and we keep adding instruments to it. And when you come as a clinic and you say, I want this domain, this instrument, this instrument, that instrument, we have in our library, we sort of wrap them up for you. If we don't have in our library, we build them in our library for you. And we create practice specific panels. So if you want to use this in a clinical setting where you don't use them yet, I think there's some things that you have to do. This is, this is what our, one of our colleagues does in Cincinnati. So she really has questionnaire. She says, the first question is, is your practice setting ready for PRO data capture? And this is in Cincinnati Children's Hospitals, and she runs folks through some questionnaires about instrument selection. So maybe you're very savvy, you know what instruments you want, maybe you need some help finding which instruments are important for you. At least tell me the domains you want, and let's do some research together. But then you answer these questions, and you come up with your instruments. Then she really asks about support. Because if you don't have the supports of your informatics folks, your leadership, and your clinicians, you're not going to have successful implementation. So I think it's a very germane set of things that Dr. DeWitt asks here, because if you don't have that, we ought not be talking. You need to go get that support. She then asks, um, you know, who will be completing this? You know, it, she's a pediatrician, so sometimes it's the parent, sometimes it's the guardian. It's different things. How are you going to identify these patients? How long is it going to take them? Is this a homogeneous population? Can they read? Um, in pediatric neurosurgery, we're working with spina bifida clinic. So there's clients that have no cognitive issues to clients who have severe cognitive issues that can't read and can't do this. There's people who have uh, um, physical disabilities that can't use a tablet, and there's other people that don't have them. So it's a broad spectrum of functionality um, in this clinic, and you have to have a product that can do it. The way that we do it, I think we've learned a lot from DeWitt, we do it, basically we sit down with a prospective person that wants to use this in their clinic and really have a conversation about what's your goal. Is your goal clinical? Is your goal research? Is your goal study? <laughs> and we really try to get them to do multiple goals. 
Then once we understand what they're doing and we talk about do you have support in the clinic, who's going to do this, we'll go and do a site visit. And here we'll really kind of walk the path of the patients and we'll understand what the clinic workflow is. The solutions in the 1917 clinic do not work in other clinics. They just do not. You need to, you need to know what your clinic is, you need to understand your workflow, and understand how to flow something in there with minimal disruptions. Um, and then we can talk about, let's set up your panel. So that starts with, you've selected your instruments. Here in this example, this is our viral hepatitis clinic. They wanted these instruments, depression, anxiety, alcohol, substance abuse, quality of life, and fatigue. What is the sequence in which they're going to be presented? So if, I, if my research is really on depression, anxiety, and alcohol use, or those are critical things for the research they're going to do in viral hepatitis clinic, well, they should be first because sometimes people are going to get tired of answering your questions and they're not going to finish them. So whatever is more important to you in your research, that's the way you want to sequence them. And then leave other ones that they're nice to have but not need to have, so leave them for later in the sequence. And then you talk about frequency. So Dr. Curtis got to this point earlier, which is, you know, depression, do you need to know that every two weeks, every four weeks, every six weeks, or every couple of months? Substance abuse, maybe you want to know that every two weeks. But there should be a time period attached to all of these so that someone, when they come in, you can't think of this as just one visit. Everybody's going to do everything one visit. You can think in one visit they're going to do these three, then the next visit they're going to do this one because I want it every time, and then these two that are once every six months. But you have to sequence them and think about longitudinally how often do I want these data to be captured. We then really start talking about internal logic um, and alerts. So here in this example from the Path of Care Clinic, people have a symptom screen. And the symptom screen, if they are, they, uh, it specifically asks how bad is your pain, and you sort of rate it on the Likert scale from one to ten. If your pain is the same level or higher, then we ask you another, a more detailed pain questionnaire. If your pain is decreased more than, more than two units, then we were not going to ask you that detailed pain questionnaire because we don't need to know that. You're getting better. So if improved pain, we skip that and we get to the other parts of it. So sort of some internal logic there. And then alerts. They wanted to know suicidality because depression, if you're having dealing with chronic pain, depression is going to make it worse. So they wanted to know not just suicidal ideation. They wanted to know people who were severely depressed. They wanted to be alert so that they could intervene. So, okay, we dialed their alert to that, and off they go. They, at some point, they also wanted some study enrollment with different depression and pain levels, and we were able to do that for them. So these are all factors. Now we got selection of instruments, sequence, internal logic, frequency, alerts. In the pediatric implementation, we've had to come up with this session of this concept of one session, multiple users. So they do, the first thing is they ask someone, they want to know if you're a caregiver. And they taught us a distinction between a caregiver and a parent. I may be a parent, but I may be estranged, and I am not with the child every day. The child in, and, and mom is working all the time. So the caregiver is actually the grandma. She's the one who spends around 20 hours a week with that patient. So they want to get to the caregiver. So they'll ask you some questions about how much time do you spend with this, with this patient, with this child. And if you are spending the amount of time that they want, then they'll ask you caregiver-specific questions and a family impact module. They want to understand what does the child's illness, how is it rippling out and affecting the family environment. Then they ask questions of, to that adult can the child participate? So now the adult will know, based on the disabilities, because of the disease, this condition, whether the child can do this independently or not. If the child can do it independently, they give them the tablet, the child finishes the second half. If the child has some issues, then they can answer it for the child. But now we know the child didn't answer that. The caregiver answered that. And that makes a difference in how they analyze their data. So our next steps, Dr. Curtis, who thankfully is here, heads a committee with uh, HSIS to get patientreporter.com's data into impact. Um, we have partnered with them to create what's called an mHealth assessment service doing a, a MOS API. And the idea is that we will feed pro instruments, promise instruments, and ultimately device data into our electronic health record. Now this has been tough to get uh, 
to get this on the list of competing priorities in the health system to get this into electronic health record, but I think we have a way in with this committee um, that he chairs, and I think I've seen more progress on this in the last three months than I had seen in the previous nine years. So we're very excited about this. And I think patient reported outcomes data is going to start showing up in impact as our first stage, and then we're going to have promise data added to it, I think later this year, and device data, I don't know that it'll be this year, but it'll be either late this year or early next, but we're knocking on the door now, and this stuff is going to be there. And there's going to be... Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Just to pause in terms of thinking about folks for research purposes and getting clinic or administrator buy-in, the potential value to the work that Jeff is doing to get these data into the health system. I mean, do you want to speak to that in terms of like, you know, where, you know, your, oh. your sponsor or funder requires that oh. you measure depression yeah. and these things that a periodicity, but it's got to be within your mm -hmm. EHR. So we, we had a, a very odd visit from HRSA, I believe it was, who's one of the agencies that helps fund HIV care, and they came to our clinic and they said, but are you screening for depression? And we said, yes, we are. In fact, since 2007. And there was that touch screen there and all of that. It was right there next to the other screen with the electronic health record. And they said, no, no, but is depression here? They said, no, no, it's on this screen right here beside it that you can see. No, no, I can't see that screen. I can only see this screen. It was the most, it was like, listen, listen, Mr. Hersa person, can you just look at it? And then, and then, no, 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 it's not there. You're not doing it. So all of a sudden, even though we're probably the only clinic on their docket that's been screening for these things for the last 11 years, we are not doing it because it's not showing up on that screen, not on this screen. What's the barrier then? I mean, why? You probably commented that. <laughs> well, well, the barrier is nine years of frustration, but I was this Dr. Curtis's committee. I'll let him, uh, he might find nicer words than me. <laughs> Really is. Mostly it's never technical. The technical part is the least right. problematic. It's the governance of it. So if you dump a bunch of data into the electronic health record, you know, does somebody have to sign off on it? Does somebody have to approve it? You know, what if another clinic is, you know, is collecting data on your patient? Does that make you responsible for it? You know, what if you had somebody covering because you were on vacation or something and it's an urgent? So who's responsible for it? You know, is the data valid? I mean, from a technical standpoint, you know, how do you validate pain? Look, I mean, that's the patient's data. But, you know, who's responsible and the validity, the provenance, where did it come from? And, you know, where do you just stick it? So a, a bit of it is technical um, because EHR vendors basically want to hold, own the, own the whole ecosystem. So Epic Everywhere implies that if you have external data like any of this, if it's not originating from within Epic or some Epic really expensive, you know, B-minus quality module add-on that costs a zillion dollars, they don't want to look at it. And so it's Epic everywhere, but no other data is allowed in that ecosystem. So they want a closed system and then to charge you a lot of money five years from now to, you know, put half of it in there and make it usable. So some of it's security, some of it's technical. There aren't great interfaces for interoperability, and it is very much anathema to EHR vendors to allow interoperability because it's against their business model. So between lawyers, interoperability, and vendors' reticence to want to let anybody to, um, you know, play in their ecosystem because it might forego revenue, it's a bit of a problem. There are some interface standards that are changing that for interoperability. So there's one called FHIR, FHIR. Um, the idea that you know, if you don't like your, you know, your task manager on your iPhone or your Android, what do you do? You go to the App Store and you spend a buck and you download a new app. Well, the idea is, is if you don't like how your EHR displays data, great, just go to the EHR App Store and download a new module for your EHR that graphs it in the way that you like. That's sort of the generalized concept. That exists at least in sort of a prototype form. The downside though is most of those things only are view data. So they're not letting you push external data in because you have to actually have a place to put that data. They're going to let you manipulate just what's there. So this idea that you could like have some flexibility is slowly starting to percolate but not yet really to the point that they'll accept external data and have a reasonable place to put it. Mm -hmm. The question that you're asking in a way is can I buy something in the Google App Store for my iPhone? Right. And the answer is, no. it's completely against their business plan, everything that they build and all of that. that, that that's the question we keep asking the EHR vendor, and the answer is, 
No. Does it exist, does it exist in other EHR vendors in private practice, not academic settings? Or this, this you, standard. Yeah, I mean, slowly, but not so much. I mean, you can build what essentially a point-to-point -point interface. It's like we're going to build a telephone system, but you can only call one person. You get the bat phone. And that calls Batman, but like you, know, you can't call Superman if what you really need is, is, is Superman. So it's it, it works. It's just slow. It's clumsy, and it's point to point. Yeah. They're starting to now be EHR integrators. So sort of the hub and spoke model. So you have your data platform here. You have this. It can talk to you know the hub, and then the hub can talk to other spokes, or it can talk to other hubs. That that sort of business model is starting to actually be a service industry that's growing that, you know, Cerner and Epic and all the other little guys, all scripts and the clinical works, et cetera, are starting to slowly integrate with, but it's been um, delayed just because, again, Cerner and Epic don't really want to talk to these people. Wow. Yeah. And it's about $20,000 to integrate with an external data source. So depending on... Initially, product, yeah, it, initially, over time it's going to be... some maintenance cost to it. So if you think about you know, how many vendor systems do I want to integrate with, if it was only 20,000, then most project budgets would not, you know, fall apart at that. But if it's like 20,000, and if you've seen one Epic system, you've seen one Epic system, if it's 20,000 for every site or system and its implementation, then quickly we'll run out of money. In our health system alone, there's over 250 data sources that are not integrated. So you can imagine putting that math, math across it. Because you live in the legacy of a best-of-breed world where everybody, everybody was smart and capable and fought as hard as they could to get the best system on the market for whatever unit they worked in in the health system. So they got this amazing accounting system, but nobody asked the question, if you go back to the innovation space, how do I integrate these data to what I already have? That's a now thing. Now we have a platform mentality. Now we know the network effect of data. But we are living in the shadow cast by the best of breed previous 20 years. So just about every health system is full of an endless amount of data sources that don't talk to each other. It's just the reality that you've inherited. Do better for the next set of people sitting. <laughs> now what about the VA system? Is that something where um, you've been involved in, like doing PROs? And no. Like no, I, 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 that wouldn't, I don't think the VA system would even talk to us. We had a tablet-based system running on an iPad I tried to put there. They said, oh, we don't support iPads. We don't support Apple products. They said, okay, what if I just buy it? They said, well, we don't want to be responsible for it maybe walking away. I said, fine, I'll take that liability on. They said, yeah, we just don't really want any Apple hardware on VA premises under any circumstances with no liability and no maintenance and no support. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the opportunity, I mean, beyond a single VA, I mean, it's a great question because if you could get headway and figure out how to integrate PROs into a VA, you then have a national platform. And the VA, I think, has been successful in scale-up in ways other, I mean, literally to get routine HIV testing took an act of Congress. Congress had to pass a law, but a, a very, you know, passionate group of folks in New England pushed for it, and once it got approved in New England, the entire VA system mm -hmm. then had a platform to have routine HIV testing. I think it's a great, a great question for someone in the back or doing VA research. Um, you know, are folks looking at this PRO model because if you could get headway with the right mm -hmm. people and get it in there, you now have a huge platform across the country. So my understanding is the VA is now going to the current system and is going to CERN. <coughs> yep. 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 No way. Yes. Yes. But if the VA has a standard system across the country, I mean, hopefully they have some leverage where if someone who's in charge decides that, you know, as when I was when I was a resident, all of a sudden, hepatitis C antibody test came back positive. Because someone somewhere decided, we're going to screen all veterans for hepatitis C. No one informed the providers. But everyone came in and had a hepatitis C test. If someone somewhere decided, we're going to screen all veterans for depression or social support or whatever, I mean, theoretically, um, they could leverage Cerner, you know, hopefully, to make it happen. One, one other thing about interoperability, just to increase the, some of the difficulties with it, is particularly the, the VA example. Have you ever pulled in data from other VA systems. Um, to me, it, I remember asking, having a chance to ask some of the technology people, gosh, this is wonderful. So if I have an allergy list at one VA, I can just spread it to all the VAs. So even if someone shows up for the first time, they'll, they'll be safe to use this. And the answer was absolutely not. We keep every one of those separate because they all clash with each other. 
Um, they're allergic to this here, but not there. They're allergic to this other product here. So the answer can't be as simple as, well, sum up all the allergies, because some of the allergies really are sort of uh, contradictory. So even in a system that looks highly integrated and you can get it from a central data source, they don't harmonize their data. There isn't one data set for one client that you can say throughout the system, what diagnosis does this person have? It'll just give you a batch of data from every place and you analyze it and parse it how you're going to, but they're not, they don't have the answer for you for that. Well, the VA used to do PHQ-9 every three or four months on the resident. On they, paper? No, on the, uh, on the CPR, on CPRS. Oh. Which is, you need to assess this, patient, this veteran for depression. Here's your PHQ-4 mm -hmm. or something that you click through the assessment, any risk for suicidality. It says a suicide risk screen on the alert. So in a sense, you're doing this low-tech, not shiny version mm -hmm. on your iPhone, but it's there. It's just yeah. that you can't map it. You can't. I don't remember being able to sort of put the levels and sort of do a data plot and what that was. It exists within their measures, mm -hmm. not separately. Yeah. You, you know, I don't think that there's anything, any particular weakness to the VA system. I, I, I think it's I think it's a great system. I do think that it has a, a footprint that's larger than, than just about other commercial EHRs. But however, the point is that this is never as simple as it seems in the beginning. There's always sort of layers to it. And, and I think as I sit here bemoaning the lack of interoperability and telling you about a best of world that isn't there, you know, there's also a bunch of issues that come with interoperability, that it isn't just that's one silver bullet and now all the problems is gone. It creates a whole new set of issues as well. Um, and the other thing I think that we're very interested in is sort of capturing PRO data outside clinic settings. Um, we've got sort of a product that's an app that we can use sort of called Study Buddy. We have some uh, partners that Jeff keeps working uh, with um, in a rheumatoid arthritis community that I think have 11 or 12,000 patients kind of using uh, sort of the base software that, that we created to capture their data. So I think there's a lot of opportunity thinking, how can I capture these data outside of the clinic, monitor people, see what we can do um, over time? Do we have to wait for them to come to the clinic to intervene or to trigger an intervention? Or how does it look like if they come into clinic and I actually have data points for the previous five months when I didn't see them, that can help me make a better decision today than just their recollection. So be a cool thing to do that way. So innumerable people are all over this presentation and please do not get the impression that any much or the majority of this is sort of me. I'm just sort of the, the guy that had the opportunity to speak to you today, but there is a ton of people um, that have contributed to this over the last decade and it's, it's been a lot of fun. Any other questions you got? Any other questions? So when you guys were building your uh, survey of PRO items, can you talk about like what sort of uh, support team did you need to say like validate that survey so that you could say you could use it later and then maybe other people could use it too? So you're talking about the selection of the survey instruments that we did. I said we hit the literature. Um, we really sort of hit the literature and say, hey, what are the things out there to measure depression? And we would find three or four things. We would look at them. Some of them are behind the commercial firewall where people are happy for you to use them if only you pay them X amount of money for everyone. So that was that was out for us. Um, but there were other surveys that were out there more in the public domain that we could that we could use and we just make sure that psychometrically they were well researched, that they were validated, that they were validated in the broad spectrum of the population. You know, it's interesting when you know they, here's ten papers, you know, total there's over ten thousand people that the survey's been validated in. That was a very different one that you know, Joe's pet depression survey that he validated with 50 of his closest friends in Maine. You, know, you kind of judge those. But I think it was primarily lit, lit review that led us to choosing them. There was about a panel of five of us, and we would just, you know, argue for the instruments. I tell you the process, starting with what are your domains of interest, mm -hmm. and then kind of looking to what instruments are out there, and, and always preferable to pull something off the shelf, unless you want to make a career in psychometrics and people do that. You develop new instruments and, and the whole process behind doing that. Um, and we were part of that promise, you know, initiative that, that did some of that work where you're doing the battery and cognitive interviews and, you know, there's just this whole process. Um, 
And then I think even if the instrument hasn't been preferably you know, validated in your population, seeing how much has it been validated, and even if not a primary focus of your research, are there opportunities for side projects to say, this instrument's been validated in A, B, C, X, Y, Z population, therefore I'm going to use it, but some of that might be finding a psychometrician to say, let's look at the performance characteristics now as we apply this well-established tool in this, in this new group. But the, the, unless no one has done it before, the investment of time and energy for folks that have done this to develop your own instrument it is substantial. I mean, yeah. don't don't enter that lightly. If there's something on the shelf, yeah. grab it, even with its imperfections, acknowledge the imperfections, unless, again, you want to make a career, which a lot of folks have done, in developing new instruments and new tools. I, I remember some of those trails, some of those literature trails, and sometimes they were 10, 12 years deep. And they would, sometimes I would just think like, this group of people just spent 12 years of their life to come up with five questions to measure left elbow pain. <laughs> and I was just amazed. I mean, I don't, I don't love left elbow pain like that. <laughs> they do. And I'm glad there's people who love it like that because now we can measure. And they they right. benefited billions of people throughout the world with their left elbow pain. That's body. right. <laughs> they'll, go to, they'll go to left elbow heaven <laughs> at the end of their lives. But it's amazing, like, when you really see what it takes for these people to, like, you know, how they value where they came from. I'm in awe of the psychomagicians. They're just a, <laughs> they're just a whole, other, uh, whole other field there. Oh, I wanted to ask a little bit more about the literacy um, and that uh, playing into PR measurement. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you guys handle, like, so if, you know, somebody's not able to complete the survey, like, practically, what do you do in your clinic? Um, is that With Sarah. Um, get somebody to help them? or Yeah, we have a team of um, researchers in mm -hmm. the clinic at all times, mm -hmm. and um, we actually have a list of people that we know need assistance, and then we have kind of what type of assistance, like, and then you help using the computer, and it could be that I stand there and they just tell me what answer, and I hit it, and it goes to the next page. Like I'm just, you know, they're a little just prompting them. Yeah, it could be that um, they don't know, they don't understand certain words in the mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. So they just want you there to explain. Mm -hmm. um, it could be that they are completely illiterate, don't mm -hmm. cannot read a yes or a no, and you read it out fully. Um, and so we have that list. Um, and we have them pre-identified, know when they're coming in, and then there's also new people um, that come up, of course, you know, the, if, if a patient's like, I forgot my glasses today, and this is the third time that we know that they forgot their glasses, we're going to put them on the list, because it may not be that they forgot their glasses, it may just be that they're, you know, they don't want to admit that they are not, they can't read. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how we handle it. Right now. Um, we make sure that we're not telling the patient, I'm here, you can't read, and I'm, you know, doing this. It's more of a, um, I'm here to assist you, make sure, you know, help you with this. And a lot of patients have been very appreciative. So, all the capabilities for audio-assisted computer software. Yep. So, uh, let me let me take that, but just to, to close the loop on you, the one thing I've heard from a psychometrician is that it's very important that they know if someone asked the question and then it was answered, because I think it introduces a different type of bias. Yeah. So going back in the design, um, I would be sure to put in a question. That's why in the mm -hmm. pediatric version it says, can this person answer the question independently? No. Then are you able to administer it? Yes. And then when I analyze those data, I know that those data aren't from the primary source. They're from a secondary source. And that helps you parse the, that out. Um, in terms of the audio one, we had that in the 2004 version. That's one of the things that we did. I think there was actually like a, <laughs> a gigantic health literacy screen, which I don't know how you could read. If you can't read, how are you going to do the health literacy screen? But, you know, there was a gigantic health literacy screen in the middle of it, and then you could switch to audio. And we had a guy who was an accomplice thespian read it. You should hear this. I remember this audio, and he would say, you know, a baka beer. <laughs> like in these HIV medications, it was the Shakespearean rendition of HIV therapy. What medications are you on? <laughs> it was awesome. I, I remember listening to those audio files, but that all went. We never went back to that over here. We just we actually didn't think of health literacy enough as Sarah's uh, 
solution to it has been the closer we've gotten to fixing that. But we thought of that in 2004. And Heidi's pointed out too that people tend to be really polite that they will wait until someone finishes the entire question, even if you know the answer, even if you've read it and know the answer, out of politeness, even though it's a someone talking to you, will wait, you know what I mean? So in terms of just lag time and, and oh. delaying, um, that out of politeness, you know, that, that a, a, sufficient number of, a sufficient number of people will, you know, again, I don't know this literature, but Heidi's talked about this idea that people are not going to go, I don't, you know, Maybe like in New York, but not certainly not in the South. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna wait till the computer finishes talking, uh, just like my mama taught me. <laughs> you got a question on the bubble or something over there? On the bubble? You got a little, little chat, little chat bubble down. The orange one, the orange one. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. I like this chat bubble too. <laughs> I feel like I want to keep talking to him now. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> All right. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you guys for your time. <laughs>